185milesouth.com. Smash that Patreon button. One hundred and eighty five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. What's up, everyone? We are back and talking hardcore. This week, we're diving into nearly the beginning of this whole thing. We're talking 1981. Helping out, you know him, you love him. It is the best dressed man on the pod. It is Daniel Set. What's up, Dan? What happened to you? You're not the same. Oh, you can't, I can't be accused of that. I'm the same motherfucker I've always been. Uh, also up and out, it is Ben Merlis, a.k.a. Ben Edge, a.k.a. Bedge. What's up, Ben? I've got the straight edge. Do you, though? Do you drink caffeine? I, do I you do. fuck? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, it's debatable then. Also, but now, don't call him Cincinnati. It is the man known as Clevo. What's up, Clevo? At the bottom, it says thank you. And you can tell him to fuck off. <laughs> That's right. Okay. 1981 it is. Dude, this is basically the start of hardcore. You know what I mean? Within the one or two year time, people argue. But it's firing on all cylinders in 1981. And just as a little uh, note before we kick this episode off, everyone... Dude, when we do these 80s episodes, they kind of fall off big time. Like people just aren't interested in 80s hardcore anymore, which is sad because it's the best shit there is. So uh, let me just say, if you haven't told a friend about the podcast recently, maybe do it. If you haven't shared the podcast on social media, now's a good time to do it and all that. Just because, uh, yeah, these episodes, I'm telling you, the 80s shit, people don't care about it that much. And that's a bummer. Time to bring it back because it is... Uh, you know, the best shit there is. Uh, Dan, 1981, hell of a year, huh? Yeah, this is impossible. Like, um, you know, this should be a Super 35, a Super 42. Like, we should go to the wheels fall off till one of us actually dies on the pod <laughs> because <laughs> there are so many good songs. Cause, and also, to all of the wonderful 185 listeners out there that get really pissed off if we pick the same bands and stuff you know it's 1981 some of the best records that have ever ever touched human ears and hands so there may be some repeats there may be some stuff like that but this year is just giving you life yeah i mean think about it you got the two minor threats seven inches and then you have Discharge Y, you know what I mean? Adolescence Blue album, a TSOL, both of the first 12 inches, right? Um, it damaged, you know? And like uh, the last one with Dez, Six Pack. Shit is wild, dude, you know? Detroit's firing, you got the fix, all that. What do you think, Clevo? 1981. I mean, it, it's really... It's just there's just so much to choose from. Um, you know, you have all of the Discord early seven inches, uh, the year and seven inches, as they like to say. Um, you know, you have Total Collector Core. Um, you just really have some foundational stuff in here. It's it it's it's just great all across the board. All right, Ben, give us the rundown and make it good enough that I include it in the Substack. It's really red versus red rockers. It's black flag versus black market baby. It's the boys versus big boys. It's anti pasty versus anti nowhere league. It's X versus the X versus the X's on the backs of Ian's hands. It's filler versus in my eyes. It's Des versus Henry. It's the kids of the black hole versus the world. First gen punk is pretty much dead and the 1.5 generations output is peaking with releases by adolescence, agent orange, bad religion, channel three, China white, Dead Kennedys, DOA, Effigies, 45 Grave, Kraut, Saigon, Shattered Faith, Social Distortion, Texas Stains, and TSOL. This sound is soon to be supplanted with a new breed of proper hardcore 
bands already bubbling up, playing faster and harder. Minor threat, government issue, SOA, DC Youth Brigade, negative approach, JFA, Circle One, LA's Wasted Youth, heart attack, seven seconds. Milo joins the descendants. Most of these bands are starting to dress down, but meanwhile, across the pond, Great Big Hair is reigning with GBH, The Exploited, and Discharge putting out their debut 12 inches. Also in Blighty, Oi is exploding with bands such as Cockney Rejects, Angelic Upstarts, Foreskins, The Business, Blitz, and The Last Resort. Finland is putting out a lot of records, most notably Radis and Llama. Uh, lots of German and French punk I know nothing about as well. Oh, and unrelated to any of this, there's a band called The Misfits who totally rule. Significant comps, Rodney on the Rock Volume 2, Public Service, Who Cares, Let Them Eat Jelly Beans, Strength Through Oi, Busted at Oz, and The Process of Elimination EP. Pro tip, grab those Solger songs before Zach scoops them all up. Uh, Soldier, put some respect. But uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, a couple things here. Uh, first off, Shout out to Ben for uh, wedging Finland in. I believe the uh, Finnish starter kit has maybe uh, helped him out. So uh, shout out Daniel from Sorry State for doing that. Uh, in other foreign stuff that you didn't get to, we should just mention uh, in Sweden, punk band Mass Media, they broke up in 1980. And from the ashes of that comes uh, a hardcore band called the Head Cleaners. They put out their first seven inch called Disinfection in 1981. So that's another uh, example of punk kind of going out in 80 and hardcore coming in in 1981 uh in italy you have like that cheetah chrome motherfuckers seven inch uh 400 fascists which is a full out of control noisy hardcore record in japan uh you have the band the stalin they put out their first lp trash as well as their second seven inch which is a japanese title i don't know what it says and then also gizm forms and they play their first show in 1981 let's go to dan for uh the order of the picks Okay, a Super 7 is where we go around Robin in a uh, fantasy football style draft and we um, can pick the same band, but we cannot pick the same song. And this is a competition to have the best seven songs. And when you're done, uh, the beautiful 185 listeners will lambast us all in the comments and tell us why we why didn't you pick this? and Or they'll just say things like, <laughs> no one that was the best comment last time <laughs> the person yeah. who voted for no one <laughs> and the order is myself then zach then ben then clevo in the ohio curse spot yeah i do just want to say like i say almost every time on here we're not making our lists to win we're making no. a we're making lists of our favorite stuff and Absolutely. people vote to see if it lines up with their personal tastes or not uh, yeah. It's not a competition of the way that we're trying to win. It's just it ends up that way with people voting. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not competitive in the in the sense where we're like desperate to win. It's more competitive in the oh man, I wanted that song. We're fighting for songs, right? Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, it's 1981. We all love Minor Threat. I think we got to get all the Minor Threat picks and talk out in the first round. Dan, I'm assuming you're going to take a Minor Threat song. Is that correct? Well. You know, do you live the gimmick? No, just kidding. Of course I am. Okay, right on. So I'm going to take one. I'm in the number two slot. Ben, you're number three. You're taking a minor threat song, correct? Correct. Okay, Clevo, are you going to take a minor threat song? Yep. All right, so let's go through. Dan, what's the best minor threat song of 1981? Um, I'm going to go when you have a myriad of choice. I have got to go, and I'm going on the strength of the song. I'm not going on the strength of what came from the song. So... I'm going filler. All right. Minor threat. Leads off the first seven inch. And it is just brilliant. <laughs> it's the way it starts, it's like a roller coaster of like flying down the thing and then what happened to you? Yeah, not that it just is perfect. And talking about religion fucking up someone's head. Could it be could there be a more punk and amazing like take on on lambasting religion? I think it's fantastic. This is a this is an example of a song being extremely aggressive but extremely tuneful, like pretty much all the other minor threat picks are about <laughs> <Yeah>. to be. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. This is a great pick, right? And it's so sick. First song, first record, 
against religion. Hell yeah. You know, I love it. Uh, ben, how do you think this pick stacks up in the minor thread, pan- the minor threat pantheon? I've never ranked the minor threat songs, but because it's kind of impossible because so many of them are tens, but this is a 10. So <laughs> can't argue against it. It's, it's great, of course. And it's the first uh, minor threat song I ever heard because it's the first song on the CD. So what a, what a way to make a first impression. I mean, it, it's it's the blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the drum roll coming in, right? It's like every hardcore song to come. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Small Man Big Mouth. Kind of a left field pick, I think, assuming that you guys haven't changed your mind since we did the top 100 hardcore songs of the 1980s and <laughs> I got smacked around for choosing this song. Um, I... There's a couple things. Like if I was going to choose the best song on the Minor Threat 7-inch, maybe I'm choosing the title track just because it's kind of got it all. And if I was going to choose the best song of the first two 7-inches, in my eyes is the opus. But like this is just an example of like that first wave of hardcore and everything that's perfect about it. You know what I mean? it's a I think it's a sub one-minute song. It's all fast. That riff is hard but tuneful, right? So nice. And then Ian's lyrics are really just something special on the top of it. It's kind of like it's like this, or like uh, you know, that first poison idea, seven inch, like the lyrics, they look like poems that the lyricists are just smashing into these hardcore songs and making them lyrics. You know what I mean? Like think about the way that that song starts, right? Compete, compete, do it for the boys. Empty barrels make the most noise. Like that's not a typical hardcore lyric. You know what I mean? So I don't know. This sets the bar so high lyrically. And then of course, like it crescendoing up to like the, the small band, big mouth singalongs. Right. So yeah. So sick. I absolutely love it. One of my favorite songs of all time. And I think one of the most underrated minor threat songs there is. Uh, Clevo, what do you think about this? Have I have I made the case for this song? I mean, it's any song on the filler seven inch is really it's it's a classic. I mean, there's we could take we could just say that we're taking the filler seven inch and then just that's it. Like sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should have. Maybe we should have just done a unity pick of the filler seven inch for the first two rounds. But uh, there's too much to spread around. Uh, Dan, how about you? Have I made the case for the song yet? Oh, the 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 song, the case you've made is very nice. But the the song is incredible. Like you you talk about that riff. That riff is so like the way the guitar sounds is so aggressive, but it is so tuneful and. The um, I love that in 1981, it's like taking on toxic masculinity and w- meanwhile still administering some of it in the chorus, like coming after the short kings. Is it because you're five foot four? <laughs> feel, feel bad for those R2-D2 skins out there. That's um, rough. You know, but I think it it's brilliant. Like, And like you said, no one was singing about shit like this really. This is why hardcore takes what punk does and strips things to the roots of normal interactions and stuff like that and or normal things that are going on around and really just gets to the bones of it. And this song does it so brilliantly. Uh, ben, you want to speak on this or you want to take your number one? Um, I'm, I pulled up the lyrics in the second verse. Um, you laugh at a man when he tries, you're just trying to make up for your size. He says that so fast, it's kind of inaudible. And like, if someone said, what song is this from? And then said those lyrics, I'd be like, I have no idea. Like, so it's like my favorite band in the world that I've listened to a million times. There's still lyrics like buried in there where I, where I, you know, I haven't unpacked it completely yet. And they only have like 20 something songs or whatever, 28 songs. So pretty neat. I I think for my pick, I'm going to go with, seeing red uh i like this song because it almost like switches gears it's well it starts with uh the bass and then it they're playing the chorus with no vocals over it and then when it shifts into the uh 
uh, verse, the chords for the verse. It's just this, such a cool vibe to it. And then I love the, how the lyrics are kind of like a lesson in prejudice. Like, just like Dan said, just like distilling thing, distilling an idea to its purest form. Like you can't get any, there's, there's nothing, there's no layer of onion to peel further than this, which is uh, you see me and you laugh out loud taunt me from safe inside your crowd. My lo- my looks, they must threaten you to make you act the way you do. It's just like you're prejudiced. You're prejudiced. That's, that's what prejudice is. Like that's the definition of it. And it's like, I, I love it. It's like you, it's sort of like a timeless song because it, it describes uh, something that, you know, in humanity that uh, will never really go away, unfortunately. Well, and it's a hardcore song with an angry dude singing angrily about being angry. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's yep. pretty sick. It's it's like, I don't know, the basics of this thing. Cleva, how do you feel about this one? I, I, again, great, great song. Um, you know, and I, I think that is really like, I think that if you're not familiar with Ian, when you hear Ian now or you see like, videos of Fugazi with, you know, Ian like scolding the crowd or whatever. Like he was angry and like these songs have like a real violence to them. Um, which is really I mean, I guess, you know, he grew up and he changed, but like he was an angry young man. Yeah. Down to fight at all times back in these days. Dan, how you feel about this one? I think this is an incredible song. Um it's it's on the filler seven inch so it has to be um and i just the rad i'm saying rad like the anger yeah the, the second the second time they go through the chorus where he's like just unhinged yeah so good so good uh clevo are you able to get the pick that you wanted to get I am. So I'm going to buck the trend a little bit and I'm going to take in my eyes uh because it probably is my favorite uh minor threat song um but really, you know, I, I think that in my eyes too kind of has that you see it more on out of step, but it's where like he just adds like these little ad libs and stuff, you know, where he's like, did you fucking get it? And then goes into the goes into the the chorus, you know, it has that sort of like, I don't know, funky, I don't know, ska, reggae, funk, whatever that the intro is on this. And then, you know, it kicks into the the actual like you know the single guitar riff where it goes into you know it's just like a mid-tempo song uh through the through the verses and then the choruses you know it's very i think what a lot of these songs have is he sings the title of the song repeated over and over as the chorus which if you watch like if you watch the videos and you know more and more of them pop up and they're they're really good quality for the early eighties, but you see like the microphone's broken and he just stands in front of the crowd, like conducting and like just everyone singing along because it's just so, it's so catchy. Like Ian for being like a young guy who probably like, you know, wasn't necessarily like, you know, a mu- I don't want to say he was a musical genius cause he was, but like he really got to a way, got to a thing that could just get people to climb all over each other and, and sing these songs and like really like want to be a part of this. And I think that really comes down to if you look at all of these songs, like at some point he, he uses the, he uses the title as, as part of the chorus, or he at least sings the title in some part of the song that people want to sing along. So yeah, I'm going to give my eyes, but I do want to point out that Dan had another chance to take straight edge and did not take it. I Boo. still have six more picks. I still have six more picks. That's true. This could be a full redemption, but then he's going to leave off so much UK shit that he can't go home. <laughs> so he's in a real pickle, dude. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, in my eyes, pickle, if you will. <laughs> yeah, this is you know, it's their free bird, their stairway to heaven. You know, this is like their epic opus, and it's a perfect hardcore punk song. Uh, Hell yeah. Dan, you want to speak on this before we go to round two? I mean, this this is the one that is the outlier from, you know, a, a an absolute murderer's row on the filler seven inch. 
And then there's this one. Like the other songs on the In My Eyes seven inch are fantastic, of course, the minor threat. But this is the big boy off of that. And the the musicality on this is just undeniable. And the yet again, Ian delivering the most aggressive and tuneful approach uh lyrically and the sarcasm, the absolute you tell me like the way he delivers that like it's basically just fuck you <laughs> you know i love it yeah his like vocal dynamics in the song are amazing right going back and forth between that voice and like the shouting yeah so yeah. good so good ben you want to speak on this before we go to dan for his uh, round two yeah this is like uh the beginning of prog hardcore it's like the first complicated epic opus in hardcore actually i against i by bad brains is recorded the year before that's omega sessions which doesn't come out until the 90s and we don't hear i against i until the i against i album which is like 86 so like i wouldn't be surprised if that was an inspiration for this like oh we can play hardcore punk and have it be complex and have there be many tempo changes in many different parts and it's still totally hardcore punk because Outside of those two songs up to this point in time, I can't th- really think of anything like that. Um, so, yeah, it's incredible. Totally works. All right, Dan. Are you going to take Someone's Gonna Die Tonight? Yes, I am. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. Someone's Gonna Die Tonight is the first Blitz song I ever heard and the one that just grabbed me by the fucking collar immediately and just was like, come with me young man because <laughs> when i heard this song it it changed so much um i think it's brilliant you know in the this is where the good times went like super tuneful there but then it's got the just the ease of the singing along it's got oys in it it's got everything about it it's just it's cooked up in a lab for perfection it's uh an absolute brilliant song and it is on the more aggressive side of some of the blitz songs uh not like the most but it still is that same thing this melody running through it from the beginning to the end i love the way it does the stop starts it like drops out and you know comes back with the guitar by itself doing the Chin, 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 and it just sounds so feeble and amazing at the same time um i absolutely love blitz and i've got to take this while it's out there you know someone's gonna die tonight yeah just kicking in with like that whatever that guitar effect is it makes it all like whatever so yeah. good and yeah it's blitz dude it's like the greatest shit there is right so melodic but so dirty at the same time I love it. This is all-time classic. Uh, Clevo, what do you think about this? I mean, I had it near the top of my list. I didn't think I was going to get it, uh, especially pick and forth. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is this is the Blitz pick for the year. Yeah, th- this is the Blitz pick. And, Ben, that goes to my theory. You know, whenever we do a year and uh, Dan needs a single pick, he always seems to roll uh, number one, huh? <laughs> That's a good point. But I, you know. I trust Dan. I trust Dan. I think he's he's playing by the rules. He's not. He's not. Uh, he doesn't have weighted dice. Yeah. Well, Ben, that makes one of us. Uh, okay, <laughs> Ben, you want to speak on this, or should I take my number one? It's great. This song's great. I was trying to figure out what that effect is. I think it's just fuzz. I think it's just distortion. It's. Um, I've talked to people before who say uh, I'd say, "Oh, what about that first Blitz record or the early singles?" I don't like oi music. Okay, dude, I get it. You don't like oi music, but Jesus Christ, we're talking about Blitz here. Like, make a fucking exception to your rule. Like, sometimes good music is just fucking good music. Like, accept that. Yeah, you know, we're not we're not trying to make you listen to uh, some deep catalog, uh, <laughs> the last resort songs. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm gonna take maybe the best punk song of all time, hardcore punk song of all time. Uh, not one point five, uh, and that's Kids of the Black Hole by the adolescents uh going against all convention you know what i mean it's a five minute and 27 second song but god damn 
you talk about the marshmallow all almost falling off the stick. This is it. This song is so perfect in that it's just like dripping with melody, but then just like dripping with like that true snotty punk delivery, you know, that only these dudes can do. And like the way that it kind of crescendos up to the guitar solo, like there's so much uh, octave work on here, but like before he like just like belts it out like you know rick agnew is like teasing you right he's like okay we're doing like this octave shit octave shit and then finally he just like lets out like into the solo it's so good and then that whole part when he's like uh you know like the nice of fry the nice of endless drinking and then when it, the singer goes the nice of violence it's like ooh, it just sounds so dark and so good and yeah i mean it's a it's a perfect song it's insane that you know like real young dudes like put something like this together. Like it's just a punk masterpiece. And I'm sure that everyone listening to this podcast has heard the song before, uh, but revisit it. And God damn, if you're someone listening that hasn't heard this, I wish I could be in your shoes right now. Cause imagine being able to hear this song for the first time. That would be so sick. Uh, ben, what do you think about this? Yeah. It's kind of like the Lord of the flies for, punk rock like just these aimless directionless kids living out of a shitty apartment in Fullerton and just committing all kinds of crimes and fucking being screw ups Um, go back and listen to the interview we did with Rick Agnew because Zach really held his feet to the fire and said where were you when you wrote this song what were you thinking describe it you know just, just he just drilled down and he got Rick to describe exactly how he wrote the not how he recorded the song, how he wrote the song, and it's really interesting. Um, this song is epic too. Maybe I'll add this to the, in my eyes and um, the uh, the Bad Brain song that I mentioned earlier. It, it's also epic. Maybe not as many tempo changes. Maybe there is though. Uh, this. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this. This is actually this was one of my picks, so you stole one of my picks, Zach. So, no, shouldn't be surprised. That's what's up, Clevo. What do you think? Uh, I mean, it's it's such an epic song, and really, um, I think that this album was possibly a little underrated. It actually still might be. I think it's a little underrated. It, I don't think it was talked about in the same sort of in the same sort of regards as a lot of the a lot of the other like early early punk and hardcore records by by the end of the by the end of the 80s and uh i i think that you know this might have just been kind of overlooked for a while um and it really it, it deserves to be held up there with 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 any of the other records we we've talked about so far this is really this whole album is just fucking great dan you want to speak on this or should i shoot it to ben for his number two in, I mean, it's a brilliant song. In the uh, to keep the pod rolling, I'll let you shoot it. But I will say, shameful for you for going for plus five minutes and and you know just writing everything else off if it's over two. <laughs> <laughs> well, other people aren't Rick Agnew, so that's what's up. Ben, let's go to you for your number two. All right, this band put out two seven inches in 1981, and. I wrote in my notes that if this song gets picked, I have no alternates because this is by far the best song. And I'm talking about The Misfits. And the song is Ghoul's Night Out from the three hits from Hell 7 Inch. This song is so, it's just catchy and it's fun. And it's like, I I would use the adjective glorious. It's just this glorious vibe to it. Like, yeah, we're going to fuck shit up. And of course, you know, Zach, it's the soundtrack to Zach fucking shit up as as a young man. He's told that story before, although it wasn't this song. Misfits are a weird, they're a tough nut to crack because it's like the seven inches are worth a billion dollars. Uh, and then they get reorganized on best ofs and, and stuff later on when we're getting into the punk in, in maybe the early 90s and then remixed and stuff gets added to it and it's just so much to pull apart and and uh but when you uh listen to the originals 
fuck it. Even even the manipulated remixes for a lot of this stuff. It's like you can't ruin these songs. They're so fucking good. Um, the other songs they recorded uh, this year, just for reference, is London Dungeon, Horror Hotel, and then the Halloween Seven Inches, which is Halloween and Halloween Two. So, out of those five, Ghoul's Night Out. It's that's the one. What do you think? Uh, out of all that, I think Halloween would be the best song. But this is a great one. I mean, it's the Misfits. It's 1981. <laughs> They're not fucking up. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I don't know, Clevo. What do you think? Yeah, it's. It, it, I think that this is probably, you know, sort of peak Misfits. Um, you know, right around this time period, really kind of going on um, and kind of becoming like just sort of the misfits that I think that you think about when, when you think of the misfits, I think that this is probably like where I would put them at. Yeah. You know, I bought a bootleg in the last five years that put all the singles in a row, which is pretty sick on 12 inch. I can't find it right now on discogs because uh, they're not very bootleg friendly, but Dan, what do you think about this? Yeah. I think Halloween just beats it out. If you're going to go head to head on those song choices, but Ghoul's Night Out is incredible. It's definitely the best song off of three hits from hell. Um, London Dungeon has always bugged me for some reason. I I really love this song. It And Ben's right. There is an element of like pump your fist in the air gloriousness to it. Yeah, it's great. Clevo, let's go to you for your number two. Uh, I am going to take from the process of elimination comp, negative approach, lost cause. Um, hell yeah. This is, I mean, this is really the first appearance of Negative Approach on on vinyl or on recording because the 7-inch comes out in 82. And this song is just, um, I, I think you hear people complain about how John John Brandon doesn't uh doesn't um sorry enunciate his, his lyrics and it's just like he just kind of screeches everything. But if you listen to to this song, the the studio version, and there's like a lot of live recordings from around this time, he was already just screeching out the vocal the vocals on on this song like from the beginning. Um, and you know it it kicks off you know with the count off, and then it's just like it's just like this just like blast of just all the instruments in his voice just coming at you uh for the choruses and then again it's you know you're just a lost cause you're just a lost cause you're just a lost cause like um it's it's catchy and it's also just in your face the entire time um i I love it and it's really just it's it's negative approach it's 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 just setting up what's about to come bands out there if you're playing like this fast hardcore and your singer is boring you got to walk in a room and make them listen to this song like 30 times in a row and they'll come out a better singer. Cause like, this is that unhinged greatness, you know, like, I don't know what he's saying here. He just sounds like he's saying you're a chichi You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like, that's cool. There's a fucking lyric sheet. You know what I mean? Like just go nuts. <laughs> and that's what he does. You know, this is absolutely great. Dan, where do you think this stacks up in the uh, negative approach uh, catalog? Um, it, It's, it's up there, but, it, it's such a, um, yeah, it is the first drop of NA like on, on a recorded that people are able to fuck with. And it, it's, you, you guys nailed it like quite perfectly by saying just the repetition. There's something about the delivery. I mean, has he, has he even gotten better? Like as an old, older man, like yes, there's just yes, something yeah. that burns inside him that it just transmits. It's like feel my pain, literally. And this song tells you that at such an early age. Well, yeah, because like the lyrics of Native Approach is like, oh, this world is fucked. This world is fucked. And then like now it's like, yeah, I was right. <laughs> this world yeah. was fucked, you know. <laughs> yes, but yes. you know, this uh <laughs> This song is the first song of Total Recall, which is like how most people listen to Negative Approach the first time. But God damn, it's so hard not to skip to Can't Tell No One. (laughs) I mean, it's like that song number two is sitting right behind it. Like, let's fucking go. 40 seconds. (laughs) I know. It's true. It's true. But it's also Can't Tell No One and it's a CD. And it's like, oh, you know, I mean, if it was a tape, I wouldn't attempt to fast forward. But a CD, ah, I don't know. This is this is. 
this is someone who just picked a five and a half minute song that can't get through 40 mi- seconds of amazing hardcore. <laughs> That's right. Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying uh, it's, it's tempting to hit that button when you know it's like right behind it, you know? I know. Um, I you. It's, the, it's, the, it's the amuse-bouche before the, before, the, before the first appetizer comes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Thank and, you, uh, Mr. Colicchio. Yes, and because Ben is on restriction from ever speaking of this band, we go to Dan for his uh, round number three. Yeah, yeah. Ben is not allowed to mention the god John Brennan. You know what I'm going to go with? Maybe the best bass tone this year? I'm going with Ain't No Feeble Bastard, No Fucking Scapegoat. I'm going uh, Ain't No Feeble Bastard off a Y by Discharge. The absolute sludginess of this bass like that it just starts and it's perfect it's um and then the tempo just the way it's still delivered like super fast hardcore vocals to an extent over not the fastest discharge song but it is just this if we if we're going on the zach scale do they call it like mid tempo to um What's the next one up? It's like a mid-tempo, up-tempo, up-tempo, mid-tempo, yeah. whatever. That's the, yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Because it's about as fast as you can downstrum. So like bands, if you got a boring singer, we're going to stick him in a room and make him listen to uh, Lost Cause 30 times. If your guitarist or your bass player doesn't downstrum, that's some fucking shameful shit. You got to put him in a room and let him play along to Ain't No Feeble Bastard 30 times, right? Because like it's just a it's one note you know what i mean like let's go get that right hand fucking to turn into a machine you know what i mean channel your james hetfield channel your todd jones let's fucking do this and yeah this is it like there's two epic mid tempo bangers on this record i'm probably gonna take the other one uh a look at tomorrow but ain't no feeble bastard dude this is one of the greatest punk songs of all time you know what i mean well, uh and, a and, great pick. And, and not not just not just that like if your band if your band doesn't know how to set up their amps to sound good make them listen to this 75 times yeah well a lot of bands chasing discharge like went way over the top trying to do it and ended up exactly a fucking to a mess <laughs> yeah yeah for sure okay uh ben you want to speak on this yeah i was just thinking like the the influence of motorhead on the whole uk82 thing I, I usually uh, focus in on the drumming, you know, that the motorhead beat, but here we have distorted bass. And I was just thinking like, where does the idea of playing with the distorted bass come from? Oh, fucking motorhead as well. I mean, I could be wrong, but they were doing that shit in like the late seventies. Great pick. I love the mid tempo discharge shit. The other thing I think that could possibly be pulled from motorhead. If we're talking, you know, the drum beat and then the distorted bass. Another is like the economy of words, you know, like Lemmy's not an overly verbose dude, you know, and like Cal, these lyrics are all so stripped down. It's like, it's so sick listening to discharge and looking at the lyric sheet. Like how I, I don't want to use the word simple because that seems like it's dismissive, but like, it's just, he has such an economy of words that is like admirable all the fat has been completely stripped and it's like you end up with these songs that are like basically like eight lines and just like beautiful poetry, you know, beautiful and brutal at the same time. So yeah. uh, And that, that's an amazing point because just think about the last line. Well, the, the last verse line of this is synthesizes exactly what this style of punk is. I say what I think, not what they want me to think. It's just, it's perfect. Yep. He ain't no feeble bastard, motherfuckers. Okay, I'm going to take... I'm going back. You know, we went over the pond. I'm taking it right back uh, to where Clevo left the sauce. I'm, I'm going to Detroit, and I am going to take a song by The Fix. I'm taking the first song off the Jan's Room 7-inch. I'm taking Cuz the Elite. Dude, this is so gnarly and also so blueprint hardcore. Like, you know when you listen to Victim in Pain and you're like, okay... This is like the blueprint template for like what a hardcore song is, you know, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, breakdown out, you know, which is like what you they would emulate, what like all the rev stuff would emulate, what all like kind of roots hardcore emulates from here on out. This song is wild 
for being 81 and kind of being so blueprint because it starts with like those drum fills and then it does maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like possibly the first time that like there's like a guitar riff break. What I'm talking about is like, you know how like on uniform choice, use your head, it cuts out and it's like the guitar goes and it comes in with the drums. It does the same thing here. Like, it, like the drums and the guitar are in and then it cuts out and it's just the riff. And then we kick in and we're fast with the riff. Like, there it is, dude. That's like a blueprint hardcore thing. I can't come up with like a time that it happens before this, although I could be wrong. And then another first in this song is there's a full YOLO part, right? Like they break at the very end and it just goes full scissor beat. It's funny because recently I was reading on Tony Rettman's Substack, which is great. I love reading it. So shout out Tony Rettman. Shout out to everyone that writes on Substack. Um, he was doing an interview with someone and they were talking about what we call the scissor beat and the dude he was talking to Ben, do you remember who he was talking to? They were talking about the emo blast beat. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember who it was, but you, yeah, okay. you you're like, yeah, they were wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk about it here and, and not to shame him or anything, but whatever. Uh, he's interviewing someone and they were talking about this beat called the emo blast beat. Um, and speaking about how the band heroin may have been the first to use it. And then one of them was like, Oh, I think crossed out used it before that and you know they're san diego too maybe they got it from that um which is kind of funny because they're just talking about the scissor beat it's not a blast beat um and it's a beat that's been used forever right like you know infest used it crossed out used it straight ahead used it so now we're going back to 87 negative effects used it that's like 1982 that demo and then here you have it even before that the fix does it in 1981 so that beat uh, what we call the scissor beat, what they were calling the emo blast beat. Like here it is. Um, I don't know if it was done before this, if this is the first or, or what, but uh, yeah, I mean, this song is just so fucking sick. It's like a perfect hardcore song. And again, I'm making up for uh, having a five and a half minute song. This song is like right around a minute, minute 20, maybe. And just perfect blazer. First chorus, first chorus. Let's go. Uh, Cleva, what do you think about the song? I had another fix song on my list. Um, and now, since there's so much to take this year, I don't know if I'm going to take it. You know, I, I think it, it would be very easy if these songs just sucked because of how rare the records are. But the yeah. fact that these these songs, like both of the seven inches are just great. And I think it's awesome that we have the ability to hear these. There's so many records that are like, just like total collector core, total loss of time. You know, there's really not. And the fact that, uh, you know, touch and go, um, you know, put up the whole package keeps, you know, keeps it at least on streaming or, you know, probably has the CD available. Um, I think that's great. Uh, one thing I, I, when we were talking about the fix, I did want to mention um, pig champion being such a record collector. Um, the fix had set, maybe sent these out as promos to get shows for like the, the tour that they did. And pig called like all the cities that they went on tour, trying to find copies of this record. That is just epic record collecting right there. You know, man was on top of his game. Um, but <laughs> really contemporaries of poison idea, um, you know, contemporaries of negative approach, you know, and really just playing blistering hardcore, I, I think, you know, once you get past like the idea that it, it's totally like rare records, um, you know, it's an early touch and go release. Um, but really, the, the songs stand on their own. And really, I, I think they probably get more credit now um, because more people have actually heard this. And it just wasn't like, oh, those fixed records are super rare. You know, really, really a, a bit ahead of their time, actually. Yeah. I mean, it, to break it down for people, it's, it's just kind of like a less catchy negative approach. You know what I mean? But it sounds very similar. And then that uh, LP came out that has both the seven inches on it. And that's been out since, I don't know, the mid 2000s. And it's always been pretty easy to get. And also it's on streaming. So no excuse. And then one last thing, just so people don't get at me. I know they're from fucking Lansing. I think I said Detroit. So don't get at me. What's up? Ben. Yeah, I know. It's all Michigan. Ben, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I hear a lot of like what Boston was doing, not Boston, the band, Boston, the hardcore scene was doing the following year with uh, unsafe at any speed. And this is Boston, not LA comps. Like a lot of those bands, like I, I hear those bands in this, but of course this is 81, not 82. 
although so few people had, they made so few copies of this record. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or people in Boston actually were listening to the fix. I just have no idea. Um, but yeah, the song, it's like a fast hardcore song that has a bass break in the middle and then it just gets even faster at the end. Like, let's just ratchet this up even further. It's crazy. Um, when I uh, went on the road with Knife Fight, we covered, I want to say Vengeance. And the weird thing is the bass was down tuned. Like who's down tuning their instruments in 1981? Like so strange. And I d- didn't pick up on that before actually, you know, learning the song. So yeah, they were on another plane. Maybe it's a, a case of regionalism, you know, like er, people were just doing their own thing in those days. They weren't super connected. All right, Ben, number three. So Zach picked Kids of the Black Hole, and every show I've ever seen the adolescents play, they encore with Kids of the Black Hole. But every adolescent show, show I've seen, they open with No Way. So I'm picking No Way, also off the self-titled album, a.k.a. the Blue Record uh frontier records this is uh an awesome song with this cool slow creepy crawly intro with i don't know what that effect is some kind of weird delay thing that sounds like a like a rattlesnake at the beginning and then just no way and you can just picture the pit going full steam ahead it's just break a bottle over your head awesome fucking punk rock music uh i know zach hates what the term 1.5 but like this is like the center of the target of what i was trying to describe when i when i came up with that term just just pure nihilism okay but what's a single other thing that sounds exactly like this this is just the adolescents playing hardcore punk like they have their own spin on it it's not like a genre well i mean if you look at the uh, the list of that I came up with, there is a lot of stuff, and it's across the board, and it's throughout different regions. Although it is SoCal focused uh, for this sort of mid tempo, too hard to be hardcore, not definitely not fixed slash negative approach territory, sort of sort of surf beat, uh, hyper punk. I don't know, <laughs> whatever you could call it, anything you want. But it ain't the Sex Pistols and it ain't Agnostic Front. What's the song that sounds the most familiar to No Way that's not Adolescence? Um, Agent Orange uh, has a similar vibe. Social Distortion uh, in the Midwest, I'd say Zero Boys. On the East Coast, I'd say uh, Reagan Youth, Teen Idols to to a lesser degree in D.C. (laughs) Great hardcore punk bands. Uh, Dan, what do you think about this? I mean, it's great. I also think, Ben, I'm with you. Go ahead and espouse your 185 truth. It's all good. <laughs> Dan with a little support. I mean, just part of it is just that the name is so dumb, right? Like 1.5. That's all. You know, <laughs> just give it a word at least, dude. Come on. Well, it's like crossover. That's there's no word like that doesn't really describe anything. It describes crossing over from one thing to another. It's like great crossing over from what to what. It's like 1.5. It's the generation in between the first and the second generation. Yeah, at least they gave a word. Look, numbers are words too. Clevo, <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you say about this? Everything I said about the adolescence record, you know, it's it's the adolescence. I love it. Yeah, it's a dartboard record. You know, I love who is who. Like, I if if I was gonna boil down like the that eighty one OC sound, like that's what I would play for someone. Because like, obviously, like amoeba and kids of the black hole or like the over the top like opus songs but like not everyone's doing that but there are a lot of bands that are doing like the snotty punk with like the a little bit of melody right like even you know going back to like the the beach boulevard comp like there's some bands on there that that sound a little bit like this but uh yeah hardcore punk bands okay let's go to clevo for his number three uh, I'm going to stay in California, uh, and I'm going to go uh, to the Dead Kennedys. And since it's here, I'm going to take Nazi Punk's Fuck Off from the In God We Trust Incorporated EP. Um, yeah. this, was, this was a toss-up between this and Moral Majority. But, you know, Nazi Punk's, I think that, you know, Jello really calling out people, people in the scene. Um, maybe not necessarily Nazis, uh, you know, really just calling out calling out jocks coming coming in and ruining shows and um really just 
you know, kind of, this is a song that, you know, doesn't really have any of that jello humor. Um, it really just points to the problem. Like, don't, don't come and ruin our scene. Um, cause we have a good thing going here. So, um, you know, it's, it's a minute long. It, it's fucking banger and it, it's got a message and it always stands up. So shout out to jello. Yeah. I love that line. When you ate the cop, it ate anarchy. So good, dude. You know, talk about a poet. This is sick. Dan, you love this song. Yeah. It's, it's the most pissed they'll ever be. And rightfully so. And it is at the time, like just extremely tough standing up to, a Nazis in the scene and B jocks that were ruining the scene. It's a unifying call to being like, get this shit out of here. I love it. Yeah, um Jello Biafra in most of the Dead Kennedy's songs and most of the songs he's ever sung, he's very theatrical and performative. You know, he he's he, you can almost see him doing jazz hands in your mind, like, ah, I'm Jello. And this song, it's just like, nope fuck Nazis just just serving it to you straight no time for any of that wackiness just like fuck you it's awesome yeah and this is the record where like you know people have an impression of dead Kennedys which Ben kind of described right there and if that's like not necessarily for you this the LP from 81 or the 12 inch EP whatever in God we trust like it might be the record for you to sink your teeth into in fact I think it might be like the the perfect entry point. If you're into hardcore, like this might be the one to, to go to. It's the most stripped down. They're most hardcore. I, and uh, I think it's this or fresh fruit is really, um, you know, both of them are, are, are pretty straightforward. It doesn't really have all of the theatrics. Yeah. But the fresh fruit still has like kind of some of the, it does have some of the theatrics, right? Like holiday in Cambodia is like a big opus, you know, I don't, I don't know. And he's he's a little more over the top, right? The California over Alice, even though that's like a single from the year before. But I mean, this you has the, the lounge version of California over Alice. So fair, fair. Yeah, yeah. And Fresh Fruit also has the, the terrible choice of doing Viva Las Vegas. Ugh. Although, although tastefully put last, but still just ending on a stinker, dude. You know, what are you going to do? OK, let's go to. Dan for number four. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with you. Viva Las Vegas by I mean that song in its own right is just dis- despicable, but the <laughs> there's something about the way Dead Kennedy's do it that just make it so much more like unbearable. And I know. Dead Kennedy's are way better than anybody else who's recorded it. I know. It gives like proto no effects vibes, right? It's like, ugh. It feels like I'm at the fucking punk rock museum, you know? <laughs> what, with Filthy McNasty? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. Okay, Dan number four. Okay, um, I was between one of two songs from this LP. I don't know if I want to go with the song that is way more traditional of the band's sound or one that is so moody and different and like pretty amazing and i think that's the one i'm gonna lean on um i was gonna go for the kkk took my baby away which is just the all-time ramones classic but i'm going with we want the airwaves like the the ramones like kind of tapping into new wave to an extent but still being the ramones still being punk and just the the production choice on this, giving it that slightly different than just the one, two, three, four, like Ramon's style. And it's just so catchy. We want the, like, we want the, air. like, it's just mm. so, I don't know. I could, it's one of those songs that's like a perfect song to drive around to. It's, it's gives you that. I, I mean, I, I absolutely love it. I'm trying to think like what my first interaction with the Ramones was. It was when I was very young, but may have been, this is definitely one that has stood out over years and years of like one of the first things I ever heard when I was, you know, under 10. And it was one of those ones that caught my attention then and has held my attention ever since. And I just, I really love this song. Yeah. It grabs you out the gate, right? Cause it has that little like palm muted, lead thing going on a little palm yeah. riff it's so sick it's also 
you know, it's the first LP that they do in the eighties. And it's kind of like a, a corridor to what they would sound like in the eighties. So it's kind of a nice uh, choice in that regard too. I think, uh, Ben, how do you think this song uh, stacks up? I actually think this is like the beginning of them whining about how they don't get played on the radio enough. I mean, that's literally what the song is about. I, it never grabbed me. Like I, the KKK took my baby away is like, that's, that's the song for this album for me like this song this album's got like you sound like you're sick she's a sensation come on now don't go all quiet on the eastern front like it's got quite a few good songs on it i just never was into this one but i love that i love that the ramones were picked let's just leave it at that you don't love that part where the where the piano it just goes plink 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 on that one light note and it just sounds so good i really love it is that, piano, just... is that a piano or is that kind of like a clacker? I think it's a piano. I think it's just a piano being hit like really hard. Oh, because you know how like the, there's that instrument, it's like the two little like rods he hit together. It sounds like it could be that too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. KKK took my baby away is the fucking track though. Let's let's be real. You know? Well, I'm just but, going with what's true to me. Hey, right I on. appreciate that. That is the move. Uh, I think I needed you to talk a little bit. Uh Okay, I'm going to take – this one's hard because there's so much shit. I'm going to take the first song off the rudimentary p 7-inch, Media Person. In thinking about this song, you know, this record is like all bangers. And really, this 7-inch is probably in contention for like the most value for your buck punk record of all time, if you think about it. Like the Minor Threat filler is eight songs. They're all – fucking perfect you know what i mean negative approach seven inch is what nine songs all perfect this is 12 songs dude and there's no filler it is so sick and like the way that this comes in it's just one of those songs where it's like okay we slamming you know what i mean and it's not like a band you would think about like all right dude i want to slam to that band <laughs> you know what i mean like they're a, a political band and shit but God damn, this is so intense. And again, with talking about how Ian smashes like words in to make it work, this is an example of like his uh, delivery of these lyrics and the way he smashes it into the verses is, Dan, you got to give me a break. I'm going to say it one time, even though I hate the phrase, but God tier, you know, like. <laughs> god damn it's like one of those ones where like you read along with the lyric sheet and you're still like what how is he doing that you know i mean he's just dancing in and out of like this verse it's insane and it's so good and there's a lot of stuff i like on the seven inch again i i don't think that there's any filler on this um so sometimes you just got to pick the first song and that's what i'm choosing rudimentary pni media person what do you think ben it's funny how you can the the vocals can be so catchy in a song where I can't make out a single word, but it's like, it doesn't matter. It's just so good the way he's singing it. Um, this is the song that, that comes into my mind when anyone utters the name rudimentary peni. So glad it made the list. Definitely not a go-to record for me, but um, I mean, they're very influential. Also influential, on an artistic level, I mean, like fine art. You know, uh, the singer did did uh, all the record covers, so it's cool that it got picked. Hell yeah, uh, Dan! You want to speak on this? Yeah, this is how you can be very verbose, like very attack on the things, but show off so much personality. Like the the singer is just he does that perfect. Like nah, nah, nah. like it just comes out so good. And the the way that bass bubbles at the beginning of the song is just so good. I mean, this is this was uh, this was a potential for me, so you grabbed it. Well, shout out Nick Blinko, Clevo. You want to speak on this, or should I shoot it to Ben for his number four? Um, I've always been more into Death Church, so um, I you know it's like to revisit this. Oh, you're a wild man. I'd go this, then farce, then Death Church, but uh, hell yeah, that rules. Okay, Ben, let's go to you for number four. Adam Bomb TNT. I'm going 1945 by Social Distortion. This is the original version on Rodney and the Rock Volume 2. They would re-record this uh, the next year 
for their own seven inch and they would add sirens at the beginning and a pretty awesome surfy drum intro as well. I don't know which version I prefer because they're both perfect. This is definitely one of those songs where I'm like, fuck, I'm never going to come up with anything this good in my entire life. I'm sure of it. Like, it's just so flawless. And it's pretty cool. It's like from the perspective of the person flying the Enola Gay, or is the Enola Gay the name of the actual bomb? Whatever. The person flying the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Um, like, I, the city looks small from way out here. I wonder who'll survive. I think it does the severity of, you know, the atomic bomb justice because it's, you know, you have, there's different ways of dealing with what was basically like trauma foisted upon an entire generation or multiple generations of like the world could end at any second. Someone could drop a bomb on us and, and it could all be over. And one of them is just like snotty sort of nihilistic, fuck it, let's all die, who gives a shit? And and some of it is more thoughtful. And this is sort of like thoughtful without being preachy. And it's just musically. And then he breaks into the guitar solo. It's so fucking good. I don't care if they're corny now. I don't. I don't care. That does not impact how awesome this song is. Dan. The early Social D is great, right? Timeless. And, you know, I, I think that, you say that they got corny, but I don't think they ever did. I think that just, you know, we hate the fans, right? And so that like gives a stink on the band. And I think that that's something that like all fans of like music need to try to make a conscious effort and not do, right? Like a lot of people, you know, oh, I don't like Pennywise. It's like, do you not like Pennywise or do you not like the Pennywise fan? You know what I mean? Do you not like Sublime or do you not like the Sublime fan? Do you not like Social D or do you not like the Social D fan? I, I do think they did fan. get corny. I think they did get corny though. I really do. But that's just my know. opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's your opinion. But like, I don't know if we could accuse him of not living it. And so like the fact that he's like a dude living it and has like always been in it, like I don't know if you can call that corny. It can kind of be like, you know, something that isn't your shit. But like he's kind of – the dude if you want like that like burnout 50s punk with a guitar down and out smoking a cigarette with like a pompadour like here's your dude right and like he put out a song in 81 like he's the fucking blueprint i don't know if like you can call that corny it's like what's corny he's not doing a fucking commercial with like toyota or like you know like he's he's not in the like the Taco Bell Pantheon. <laughs> like what, what are we talking about? What's corny? Um, He's just like a dude that aged. I mean, I'm just saying on, on an artistic level, they end up putting out a, an album with the title hard times and nursery rhymes. And then he does a solo album called cheating at solitaire. It almost feels like a self parody, but like, I, I hate to just dig into like later social distortion and my p thoughts on it because I'm trying to like, explain that this early song by them is like flawless but sure you but know, have you ever spent it? five minutes like looking at the genre of country music <laughs> you know what i mean like that's what that shit is oh i don't like country music though right so that like, might explain it yeah but again it's like your ignorance doesn't lead to something being corny you know what i mean it's like that's what he's pulling from it's just not for you so that's all i think i'm, I'm defending your uh your band here ben uh, Dan, what do you think about this? Well, thanks for the uh, diatribe, Zach. Sick boy, Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> That's B-O-I, by the way. <laughs> You're on a sick one right there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Ben's right. This is this is so catchy and so great. And yes, the bomber jet was uh, the Enola Gay. Yeah, I'm going I'm to touch on that when I take my discharge pick, too. I got a little thing. You know, I've always said that I think that Social Distortion is a better rock band than punk band, but th this song is this song is a jammer. So I'll, I'll give you that. Hell yeah, Cleveland number four. Number four, I am going to take uh, Agent Orange, and I'm going to take the LP version of Bloodstains from the Living in Darkness LP EP, whatever it is. Um, nice. Yeah, uh, Bloodstains. Uh, <laughs> just 
you know, we talk about like perfect punk rock songs. We talk about like, you know, greatest songs, greatest punk rock songs or whatever. This has to be up there. You know, it's got the catchy sing along. Um, you know, it's really, you know, just kind of, you know, just a song about just being a young fucked up punk and really, you know, it's just such a great song. Um, when I went to punk rock karaoke, like, I don't know, it was sometime in like the late nineties, early two thousands. And it's like, you know, Greg Hetson and Des, I think was playing guitar and Eric Melvin. Uh, and I got there and they had the sign up sheet for people to sing. And next to bloodstains, it just said in like this big caveman scrawl, it just said Hank and Hank straight edge came out. Hank Pierce came out and he had props. He put his little slap shot jacket on, uh, on Greg Hetson and like all this stuff and then just totally ripped in through this song. So, um, yeah, it's just such a fucking great song that just makes you want to jump on top of people and sing along. So blood stains, speed kills, fast cars, cheap thrills, dude. One of the greatest hardcore songs of all time, hardcore punk songs. Um, yeah. And, and a cool pick, right? Because I mean, a little bit of a cheater pick, right. Is in a 1980 song, but gets redone. Um, but their 81 album, like they really dive into some of those like darker melodies, like thinking about like the last goodbye and everything turns gray. Um, those songs are like out of this world, you know, like just songs that are, I don't know. I mean, like they're just kind of mind blowing to me where this is like such a straight song. It's almost like it's two different bands in a way, but uh sick. I love both sides of it. Ben, what do you think about this? Um, I absolutely would have picked this except that I prefer the, um, Rodney on the Rock version to the LP version. So I guess when we get to was that 1980? I don't know, but um, I, I I might pick an Agent Orange, another Agent Orange song later. This is their best song for sure. I saw the band Cosmic Joke recently, and they did this song, and all these teenage kids sang along, and I'm like, awesome! All these kids know know Agent Orange, and then and then right away I was like, I bet this is in the Tony Hawk Pro Skater soundtrack, and I looked it up, and it is, and I'm like, that's why they know it. I'm sure that's why they know it. But hey. We got into songs, whatever way you you get can get into good music. Great, more power to you. You made it. You got there. <laughs> There's a lot. There are lots of different paths, but all paths lead to blood stains. Yeah, shout out Tony Hawk and shout out to the uh, Jamie Thomas up up grind. What's up, uh, Dan? You got anything on this? Yeah, this is a uh, an absolute great song. But yeah, it's a Tony Hawk powerhouse <laughs> and. Um, I think it was even used in like ads. This and that one Dead Kennedy song that just <laughs> is the fucking title track. Like while you're loading the game and you're like, I never want to hear this ever again. Police car, police. Oh. yeah, police truck, yeah, police truck, yeah. Oh my god! Funny thing about so my friends Swindle, San Diego punk band went on tour. They were psyched. They were like, Oh shit, we play with Agent Orange at this place in Texas. They got their Agent Orange go, um, we're going to play before you. <laughs> They're like, what? No, this that sucks. You're like the big band. They're like, yeah, but we've got to leave, blah, blah, blah. Play before them. Swindle gets off stage. Like half uh, Over half the place empties out before they play. They get done. They go to get paid. And the person tells them, no, Agent Orange took all the money. They said they were going to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> That's sick. You know, Somali Pirates played with them. Uh, we played, it was some outdoor show, at like a skate shop here in San Diego. And they showed up and they just had like, like tiny little ass practice amps. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? But they're just old <laughs> ass dudes and don't care about being loud. And it was like outside. So it wasn't like loud at all. But like, they sounded great. I mean, like, you know, it's funny when you see bands like doing like full stacks and shit. It's like that's straight up nerd behavior for two reasons, right? Like if you're playing somewhere, your full stack is going to overpower the PA, right? Or you're playing a club where they're mic and everything anyway. And the fucking sound man's going to be like, turn it down a little bit, turn it down a little bit. You know what I mean? So I like, guess kind of yeah. sick that a band just like knew what they were doing. It's like, we're going to bring these tiny ass little amps that can, toss in the back of my Corolla, you know what I mean? And turn up to eight and do this shit, you know? So uh, respect to them. Okay, Dan, let's go to you for your number five. 
parasites taking over the country, parasites taking over your home. Um, I'm going with the first song from Demolition War by Subhumans, Parasites. The way this guitar comes in, like it sounds, it it's so sick to be like this kind of anarcho band, but then the guitar sounding like almost like proggy at the beginning, and then the drum hits, and then the rest of the the song like goes to the sound of the subhumans and it's so good um this is another case where the verses have like such great appeal that they're almost better than the chorus and then um later it it drops and it does this parasites take it over the country to end the song like parasites take it over your home and you know we talked about anola gay and you're probably going to talk about it next 1981 real fear of nuclear war wiping everyone out and it is definitely bleeds into all of the music not all of it but it bleeds into a lot of the more politically charged music of this time frame yeah this is a great pick dude all these subhumans eps are sick and talk about a record that rules that LP they put out with all the EPs on it. It's like a must yeah. have for any punk record collection. Let's let's be real here. This is great. And you're right. The way that it crescendos up to like that sing along at the end. So good. Um, yeah, you can't fuck with the shit. Ben, you're a sub humans maniac. What do you think about this one? Yeah, this came on just like 20 minutes before we started recording. This came on in my car and I was like, you know, smashing the steering wheel, singing along. It, it's I have it as an honorable in any other year. It would probably be a pick of mine. Um, this is like, I've said it before, UK subhumans are the total package. You have got, you have guys who can play their instruments very well, write very good songs, have incredible cover art and have a lot to say. Like how, how often do all those things line up in one band? Not very often. I can't, I mean, if I thought really hard, maybe I could squeeze out a few more, but this is the one that springs to mind of like, all boxes checked. This is how you do it. And still kick ass, right? Like yeah. you talk to anyone that goes and sees the subhumans, like even in the 2020s and they're like, God damn, that band is still good. You know? And like how many bands from the early eighties can you say that about this? Like a dwindling number, you know what I mean? So uh, there's that. Uh, Clevo, you want to speak on this or should I take my number five? I think it's weird in the eighties, like bands that bands that like you, you heard and bands that you, like you didn't hear because there wasn't like, you know, you had to take a chance on a lot of stuff. And some humans yeah. I think was a band that I found out about because someone in my circle took a chance because of the cover art. So shout out to that. Um, you know, it, it, it's really, you know, they, they are really like Ben said, just like the total package. Yeah, I mean, like full disclosure for everyone, I never got into this band until like my late twenties. So no shame out there for people that aren't into anything. Like you can, your whole life is discovery, right? Like fools are the people that think they know it all and don't like try to discover new shit. So yeah, I mean, I figure this. I I got into this band after high speed internet. You know, when I could like get shit off Blogspot. Like I didn't own these records back then. And yeah, it's like Clevo was saying, you had to take a chance on shit and like. You know, when I was coming up, like the crusty punks in my area were a bunch of better than you fucking nerds. You know what I mean? And like I shied away from that stuff. And it wasn't until like I didn't give a fuck about like the the politics of who's a poser and who's not. You know what I mean? Like breaking out of that high school mentality that I was able to like be like, all right, those guys actually probably liked better music than I did. You know what I mean? It's just their attitude was so fucking sour. They can still go fuck themselves. Um, so, well, yeah. You know, I was saying like, you know, the adolescence just kind of didn't make it to me. But like, if you're a kid and you don't know what it sounds like, and you see a subhumans record, you see that blue record that just says adult dash lessons, like <laughs> which one, which one are you spending your $8 on? Yeah, I don't know. You, you know, me and Ben, we're baby blue boys, so we're going that yeah. way. But uh, point taken, point taken. Um, okay. Dan served me up and Ben served me up in the last round. I'm going to go into my number five pick is Discharge, A Look at Tomorrow. Uh, it's the other mid-tempo banger off Y. And 
just a perfect punk riff, right? For the people that like want to work that right hand. Perfect. You know what I mean? Only one band can do that riff first and it's them. You know what I mean? And then again, like just the, the economy of words of the lyrics. And here we go into talking about the Enola, right? So uh, there's that line. I look at my window to the briny, the blinding bright light, Enola passes, passes by is the line that they uh, have about that on here. And yeah, the Enola Gay was the B-29 bomber that carried the nuke that uh, dropped on Hiroshima. So the first time that a nuclear weapon was used in war. Um, yeah, wild. These lyrics are so sick, dude. Like that last verse when he says, skin is shed like that of snakes, but it's not the work of mother nature. God damn, dude. Apex discharge. You know what I mean? Mid-tempo banger with lyrics like that. It's like one of the greatest bands of the world, right? Like that 80 to 82. Is is the LP the following year or is it 83? It's 82, I think, right? So like that run 80 to 82 is like fucking some of the best shit ever. And everyone knows like this is not obscure at all. Like fucking Metallica covers Discharge, you know what I mean? So... It's just like a, a band everyone knows and loves and for a reason, right? They're just like one of the greatest fucking guitar rock bands of all time across all genres. So Dan, how do you think this stacks up against yours? Um, yeah, it, it this one's got more like it's just a there's more lyrics on it, there's more um descriptiveness and it has a little bit more like kind of like the guitar really takes off and has that little soloy part. So it's, it's giving you a bit more. It's like a, a grandiose version. I like the synthesized sludgy dirtiness of the, of my choice and the, and the clear message of the, this, but I mean, it's, it's like a 10 versus a 9.999, <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is probably 30 seconds longer than Eno Feeble Bastard. Uh, the solo on this I like more. Uh, this is this is a great discharge solo. So uh, yeah, shout out Bones. Um, okay, let's go. In the sake of moving along, let's go to Ben for his number five. My last two picks were Orange County. I'm sticking. I'm staying in Orange County. Well, well, I'm doing a little bit of Long Beach too. I'm going T S O L. The song Peace Through Power off their Dance with Me LP. Uh, TSOL put out their two best records in 1981. So maybe they shot their shot too quickly. I don't know. But <laughs> this song is, I don't know. This is my favorite TSOL song. I'm probably alone on that one, but there's a line in it where he says, The Remington Electric, I'm banging on its keys. And I always thought, Oh, he has a little toy synthesizer. It's like, No, Remington Electric is a is a fucking typewriter. He's typing out the lyrics to the song. It took me years to, to figure that out because typewriters pretty much went extinct when, by the time we were like in seventh grade or something. Um, and then there's a great line, peace through power is their motto, power through peace is their crime. I love that, how it's like, um, you know, the government is basically is counting on people to not uh, – overthrow them or, or, up, or rise up uh, at, so they can maintain their power. Um, and it's like Orwellian doublespeak uh, that they use often. And it's like TSOL are one of these bands where it's like, it's, it's kind of aggravating hearing Jack talk about his own band because all he wants to talk about is like, yeah, and then we blew up a bunch of stuff and then we like uh, tortured people. And then we like uh, strung a guy up in my garage and then we, we were totally drunk the entire time it's like but you made incredible music with incredible lyrics do you want to do you want to talk about that at any point so here i am doing doing uh jack's job for him saying his band is incredible or or at least was in 1981 that's for sure and it's and it's that surf sound it's that adolescence social distortion agent orange a uh, lot of rides eighth notes on the ride symbol descendants do it too it's that beach sound that is like the shit. Dude, this is a great pick. I love it. I love this whole record. And you're right. The first two 12 inches are where it's at. So 1981, 
we got FTSOL on here. I always love that Silent Scream song the most. It's like kind of the outlier song on the record. It's like kind of just a full, I don't know, is that just like goth song? Yeah, I don't know. I just, I thought that the lyrics were just so fucking clever, like in their simplicity, but also like, you know, cleverness, I guess, to repeat the same word because I'm a moron. Dude, I was recently reading, there was an interview with Jack in No Echo. And he straight up said that like all those lyrics are jacked. So I guess like the guitarist or whatever brought in these lyrics was like, here, use these. And Jack was like, there is no way that this dude fucking wrote these. He can barely count a potato. You know what I mean? And like, I guess he's like, no, I wrote them, whatever. And so like they did the song. And then like months later, the dude's girlfriend hit up Jack. It was like, oh, so you liked those. uh, You liked my book, huh? And he's like, what? And she's like, oh, yeah, I lent so-and-so like this book. It's this like little picture poem book. It's by David Lord Porter. And I bought a copy on Thrift Books. It's super sick. It's just like a little postcard sized book that has like illustrations. Then each page has like a line. And it's just that fucking song, dude. (laughs) Like, oh, my God, the whole thing's jacked. So that's like taking some sizzle off that song, unfortunately. And I'm, I'm glad that Ben picked this because... TSO had to be on here. I was going to take that song for sure, but now maybe it'll uh, free me up to take something else to spread out the love so we don't get butchered of those comments. Why uh, Why do you guys pick everything the same? Dan, you want to speak on this? Yeah, to me, this song has always reminded me of The Dam. Oh, yeah. Like, 100%. Like a s- super similar sound, especially the way that the vocals transition from da, 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 and then to the da, na, 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 na parts, you know? He changes like 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 Ben said, the Remington Electric. With that thing that you were talking about with the, the lyrics being stolen, it, it's just for one song, right? Well, that's what makes me wonder. Like Ben's pulling out like a piece here where he's like, oh man, that's really brilliant the way like they use this. I was like, who knows, dude? <laughs> like this might be the only one they owned up to. No, I think I and maybe that's the one where they let the guitar player write the lyrics and he did that. Because I feel like Jack definitely was I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'll be proved wrong, but I feel he was very heady. Yeah, that I want to fuck the dead. Super heady, dude. Into this, you know. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> necrophiliacs are people too. Ugh. Moving on. Uh <laughs> Clevo, you want to speak on this or do you want to take your number five? Um, yeah, you know, I had them on my list and you know, as we're getting into the later rounds, I probably am gonna go some different directions. So with that being said, I'm gonna take um, the effigies haunted town from their haunted town EP. Um, yes, I think that we've, we, we've talked effigies before. And I think, I think the last time I took the effigies, we said that, you know, really prime effigies is either the first seven inch or the CP. So yeah, this is a great song about just sort of white flight and dying, dying Midwestern cities. You know, they, you know, We're definitely on that sort of post-punk. They get a little more angular, you know, as they go on, especially by 1984. They're really, they're really like, like pushing that post-punk more, more influenced probably by Wire. Um, But uh, this song, you know, I think the riff is great. It's super catchy. And yeah, you know, like when he sings, it's, it's a little... It's a little, I guess, like kind of hypnotic the way he sings, the way he does the choruses and then or sorry, it does the verses. And then the choruses are really just, you know, live in a haunted town. It's really repetitive. But yeah, I, you know, got to got to give a shout out to uh, to Effigies because I think that they were just doing something a little bit different um, in Chicago, you know, really um, kind of isolated from from other bigger scenes and and doing their thing. I love this record and I love this song so much. I love that like little dark lead that comes out of the chorus. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love this so much. I wish that someone would repress, like they put out a collection of like all the EPs called remains, uh, remains non-viewable came out in 89 and it's been out of press forever. Can someone just get that and fucking repress it? God damn. Like that's too long for it to be out of press. So I don't think you can get any of this early shit on vinyl. I think it's all like they didn't do a collection or anything, did they? I don't think so. So it's kind of like whatever. It's been existing on my iPod and then my iPhone and now just in streaming forever. But like I've never had any of this on vinyl and it's kind of 
a pisser. You know what I mean? Like I want it. Can someone fucking put it out? Take my money. What are you doing here? I have, I, I think we actually, I think the last time we talked about, we talked about, when we talked about Weirdo Machine, uh, I think we talked about this. And this is sort of, it's one of those records that suffers from being repressed too early. Um, mm. You know, it is available on, it is available on streaming. So, yep. so there is that. But yeah, it's, um, it's a shame because I, I, I was, I was just trying, I was just going to check, um, I think maybe on the the first LP there might be some some bonus tracks too if that's if that's like roughly available but um yeah it's really um that collection um the remains non viewable which you know the only thing that I have on vinyl is the is the first 7 inch um oh that's so sick um but other than that this is this record has actually been on my top wants for a while and just keeps getting more and more expensive yeah i know i need it too the cd is available so ben handle business that got pressed in that that one got repressed in 95 but still it's like goddamn 29 years since uh even the cd has been pressed so someone step up handle business there's been so many good represses and uh fuck it you know i love those fan club pressings so let's do it okay dan let's go to you number 6 okay so in the in the preparation of doing this, I was gonna, and I probably would have taken it way earlier than than now uh, if it had been there. But there's a song by the Foreskins called "One Law for Them," yeah, and it's just an absolutely incredible song. But the more I like, you know, listen to it, and I've I fully like looked into the lyrics today. And it's like borderline racist. Really? And it's kind of, yeah, it's bumming me out. Like, like this is an all-time song for me, and it was going to be like an early pick for me. And it is, it's, yeah, it's racist. Like, straight up, like, and it, it's bumming me out. That is a bummer, because that is an all-time song. And how did yeah. no, no one notice that till now? Yeah, like, so... It, it, Go to the football, throw a brick, got no mercy, months in the nick, like, and then, then it says, so that's what happens to us. But right in the ghetto, the guilty free, the innocent hurt, and then they quote fucking Enoch Powell. We've been warned of rivers of blood. See the trickle before the flood. Like that is, it's just crazy. Like I'd never noticed that, and like this song is so good. And now, now it's. A bummer for me. So yeah, I never read the lyrics. I thought it would be like a one law for them, like the rich, the elite, and another one for us. That's exactly <laughs> what I took it as. Like yeah. I, I've always taken it as like one law for working people, and another law for the rich, and another law for the police doing the brutality. And right. now that I'm like reading it, it's some fucking blue lives matter type lyrics. It's fucking bullshit. Well, what's your real number six, Dan, now that you've bought well, me out? Yeah, I know. Well, you know what I'm going to tell them? I don't want to hear it. No, you're full of shit, Foreskins. Um, I'm, I've got to go, you know, I've got to reclaim minor threat for Daniel. Um, I'm going, <laughs> I don't want to hear it because think about this. This is just an epic, like, hardcore punk song that, the same line is repeated every other line through the entire thing. And as a way of just drumming down, like, I don't want to hear it. This fucking guy who hangs out is full of shit. Like he's just lying all the time. And then, you know, it, then it, there's a part in the song where it drops out, the guitar comes back in and the drum roll brrr, comes back in again shut your fucking mouth. I don't care what you say. Like when it comes in there, it's just, and I hate to say it, Zach, it's God tier right there. Oof. And then, and then at the very end, Oh, shut up. The <laughs> best ending, like just so great. So I'm dipping back in track two off the filler seven inch minor threat. Yeah. And if you tell Dan, uh, you still haven't picked a straight edge song by minor threat. He's going to say, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> um sick yeah good okay i am going to take uh i'm living my life living my life on the edge of a knife 
GBH knife edge, dude, mm. it's 81. Cool. But we're doing that UK 82 shit. This is like, so blueprint, just perfect. Right? Like the same way that like D beat, you take a, you take a riff, you just fucking milk it. It's such a stripped down style of hardcore. Um, UK 82 is like the same. You take a riff, you fucking milk it, you know, like let's fucking go. And GBH so great at writing simple choruses. You know, I think I, I can't remember. I think it was Ben said that like, you know, minor thread is like, Oh, actually, it might've been you Clevo. He like Ian just takes a fucking, he takes a title and sings it as a chorus. Right. I mean, like that's every GBH song It's happening like all over the world at this point, because like, all of the cliches haven't been taken yet. You know what I mean? So you can just like have a chorus that's like a, a couple words or a sentence and just say it over and over. It hasn't been taken, which is so sick. Um, living my life at the edge of a knife. Fucking A, dude. And GBH, one of the all-time greats. Uh, this 12-inch is great. And uh, yeah, what do you think, Dan? So good. I, I mean, the way it starts, and it's like ominous and then the bass like answers it's like a call and response and they both just have this ominous like negative space around the riff for a second and then it takes off and it's just like yeah a d beat stomp like uk82 like perfect drum beat like so good and yeah the way the music sort of drops off on the edge of a knife like it it's everything yeah, and then like that lazy guitar that's like by itself too. It's like at the edge of a knife. It's like da, na, na. <laughs> it's all like yeah. sloppy. It's like this is so fucking punk, dude. Hell yeah. Um, okay, we're speeding along. Ben, let's go to you for your number six. All right, for my number six, I'm going to leave the West Coast, fly back to the East Coast, and I'm going to pick. It's about time that we had a change by Youth Brigade. That is the DC Youth Brigade on discord records um this is la youth brigade's a better band but this song is the best song ever by any band called youth brigade um (laughs) i i love the lyrics sometimes i just yell them to myself in the shower it's like i thought we all wanted something new i thought we all wanted something new why did it end up the same don't you know it's up to you you've got to make the change and then they go in on come to our shows and all you do is fight um, fuck you. Uh, come come to a show just so you can find someone to fuck. Fuck you as well. It's just like let's go down the checklist. I mean, it's like minor threat really make sets the template for for this whole scene, and this is like you know a continuation of it. But it, it's just so well done, and it's man, you can just f- hear the anger in this dude's voice like minor threat. But you know, it doesn't have that melodic edge that minor threat has but it's just if you it's just pummeling it's and it's what a great sing-along too it really is sort of like the the amalgamation of you know kind of that uk sing-along punk sham 69 type shit with like american hardcore fast ass hardcore um it's just one of my all-time favorite songs yeah it's an all-timer you know and if we're looking at things in complete black and white, you know, some people think punk is destroy and hardcore is rebuild. Like this would be uh, a little example of that. Like, you know, it's, it's positive, right? In a way, about time that we had a change. So there's that, even though I don't subscribe to that, that punk is all destroy and hardcore is all rebuild. But like some people see it in that black and white. Uh, Clevo, you want to speak on this or do you want to take your number six? Um, I had point of view on my list. Um, I think that like I, I say this in in the best way. Like I think that DC Youth Brigade is like it's just like such caveman music, but like in the best way possible. And also, um, you know, the song that Ben picked, uh, side by side, just covered all the time too. So it kind of with Jules's voice, it, it kind of takes on a, a, a little bit of a different turn, but. Uh, yeah, really. I, I think a band that goes underappreciated um, because they're kind of in the shadow of, of all those other DC bands at the time. Number six. My number six is going to be, I can't believe it took this long to get to it, but I'm going to take Black Flag from Damaged LP. Um, and let's, you know, let's go to the tried and true method. Uh, take the take the opening track. I'm going to take Rise Above because um, yeah. I fucking love that riff. 
And uh, yeah, um, whatever you think of Henry Rollins as the vocalist of Black Flag, um, I really like him. But this is obviously Henry at his punkest, hardcorest with Black Flag. Um, And it's a fucking rager. Um, You know, Greg, Greg with that fucking Ampeg guitar welded welded to, with everything turned up to 10 um just fucking cranking out the distortion and just you know just everything about this um you know five piece black flag is is the best black flag um and yeah i it's, it's everything you want from black flag <laughs> unless you don't like henry rollins as a singer yeah this is great and it is wild that it took this long for it to get taken whether you like rollins flag or not And uh, this song is just an all-timer. It's undeniable. This riff is so fucking good. It's like a, yeah, I mean, it's a top 10 Black Flag song for sure. You know, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, this is, it's sort of kind of an outlier for Black Flag because Greg Ginn wrote the lyrics. He wrote the lyrics for most of their songs, but it's like oddly positive for Greg Ginn, like, we are born with the chance and I am going to have my chance, which I just love. That's just such a great lyric. And it's like, dude, Greg Ginn wrote that. What? <laughs> and, it, and it's such a, and it's like, it's pretty much the, huh, I'm going to think of like five uh, other examples after I say this, but it's like the sing along for this band. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's got that, like that kind of angular, like, kind of off time riff though where like the time changes come in really weird but i just love how the guitar is just so overdriven it's just like on the verge of just being like feedback and you know he does call the ops jealous cowards so it's not completely uh it's not completely (laughs) positive (laughs) true true yep hell yeah okay dan we are to the heartbreak round what is your number seven all right so i'd planned on doing (laughs) <laughs> minor threat for six and seven to reclaim that and to take straight edge here but you know i i do want more things to be out there for <laughs> so i'm gonna just live the gimmick not take it right now and i'm going with i mean the the best one of the best intros up there with with um the Warzone women skit, I'm going no mess, no fuss, just pure impact. Every fucking saw, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, I'm going King of the Jungle, the Carry On Oi version, Last Resort. This song's so good. The verses are great, but the chorus is just an all timer. The warriors strong. The warriors pr-. like. And then the part, like, it does the warrior strong, the warrior's proud, the warrior stands at the edge of the crowd, like, does that, but then it gets to the back end of the chorus and it does, he's like, can you Django? And it's got the drums going, brr, brr, and it just, it's so good, like, it's so catchy and so great, and, you know, it's just, it's just an amazing song, and I, I just love the the way the the song starts with that amazing like skip but then the bass like the way the bass just starts the song and the drums are doing the and it comes in and it it's just great it's perfect fucking great oh this is a band that the majority of their songs don't live up to them being as one of the like you know a tier oi bands because of their imagery is so cool but King of the Jungle and Violence in Our Minds, like both those songs like are all timers, but I'm going with King of the Jungle because of just that little bit, no mess, no fuss, just pure impact every time. Like that is just, it just is everything. It's so perfect. Yeah. It's their second best song for sure. You know, um, a, a very hit or miss band, even on the classic record. And I think that, what a lot of it is, is if they had the drummer of Blitz, it would be so different. This drummer plays such a simple, like chunky style that like the songs are really good, like in spite of it. But if they had a more driving drummer, like this band would be, you know, I mean, like you'd be able to get through the record. Also, 
that first song on the LP, I mean, now we're talking 82, so I won't, but freedom is a wild first track, you know, a five minute <laughs> song of this. Like it's, it's so long for like no reason, you know, it's like, oof, like, let's get to the good shit, you know, you're listening but to I, it and you're like, I wish I was Ben. I yeah, could skip. That's right. I mean, I, I, I love that song just for like, that it's so psychopathic that it's so long and so simple. It's the most long, simple song probably in the history of rock and roll. You know what I mean? Like what the fuck? But, uh, okay. That's sick. Good choice, Dan. I am going to take, God damn, this is heartbreaking. There's so much. And we're trying to get out in two hours, uh, which is already too long. I'm going to take black flag. I've heard it before. Clevo went, uh, Rollins, we got to say Rollins second best, the second best black flag singer of 1981. In fact, Rollins sounds like someone trying to sound like Dez <laughs> really. Um, and Dez is just better. So I've heard it before classic black flag song. In my opinion, the way like it starts with like, I don't know, 30 seconds of like that discordant guitar shit uh, with Dez like talking over it. And it's like, building up building up and it's kind of like you know you're you're in the fucking mind of a madman right and he's just gonna snap it's like a it should have been on the falling down soundtrack you know like <laughs> i don't know it's like it's building up and i love when he says don't need their bogus attitudes i've got enough of my own and it's like oh you got bogus attitudes like that's sick to <laughs> you know have that self <laughs> that self-awareness like dude i got a bogus attitude i don't need yours you know <laughs> And then building up to like that part when he's just saying over and over, like the bullshit authority, bullshit authority. So sick. And then also shout out to probably like the best late catalog war zone song, bullshit authority. What's up? Um, and then when it breaks in, it's just like your classic black flag, like kind of in between the two eras, right? Like that blazing up tempo, mid tempo punk. And then the, you know, speed up, slow down shit. Um, I heard it before. Don't want to hear it again. So good. And it has one of the greatest uh, one, two lines of all time, right? Don't forget your socks. Don't forget your shoes. Mama's little baby. Fuck you. Like what? <laughs> Dude, that is like all time line. Like what? Where did that come from? But like, I need it, you know? So uh Yeah. This is one of my favorite Black Flag songs, uh, top 10 for me. And uh, yeah, what do you think, Ben? Yeah, it's. I always think about this like Black Flag is one of the, I don't know, five or so most influential hardcore bands of all time. And for a band like, for a template band, they're so weird. You know what I mean? Like you'd think that every template band in a genre would be like copied so much that they would almost sound generic in retrospect. But like Black Flag's like a really unique sounding kind of strange band. Like, they have that tension and release thing where Robo speeds up and slows down. Like you mentioned, like not a lot of bands do that. That's kind of an unusual thing to do. And they got the, they have those, those uh, intros that just sound like they're about to explode. Uh, they do that in a few songs. Um, it's a great pick. I had a different uh, song as an honorable, but you can't go wrong with the first four years. Yeah, that's right. I mean, with talking about like how the effigies need to, put out like that comp again of all their EPs. Like you got to shout out to SST and black flag, like the first four years, like let's just dump all the good shit onto one LP. Another one of like, it's gotta be in our collection, right? The subhumans EP record first four years, black flag. Come on people. Let's do this. Um, and Ben, that's a pretty brilliant way of describing the tension and release. I don't know if, I don't know where that came from, but, God damn, that's a really good way of uh, describing like that blast flag, blast type shit. Um, okay, let's go to you for your number seven. All right. Um, I'm leaving so much on the table, but I'm going to pick this for a couple reasons. One is that I forgot to mention this record when we did our best punk uh, records of the 80s, punk and hardcore records of the 80s. Completely forgot about it, so I'm going to pick it here. And the other thing is I my list feels incomplete if I don't go across the pond to the UK. I'm picking the song Electric Guitar by the band Empire. This is on their Expensive Sound album. It's the only album they ever put out. So Empire was the guitarist and the drummer of Generation X. They had enough of Billy Idol. 
and Tony James's rock star bullshit. So they're like, peace. And the funny thing is, like, Generation X is this band that just wrote endless amounts of catchy tunes, but it was Billy Idol and Tony James writing the tunes. So if you think like the two guys who did, didn't write the songs bail and start their own band, yeesh, how is this going to turn out? And it's like, oh my God, these guys know how to write songs too. This is fucking incredible. How are all these guys in the same band together? Um, and this song is like hyper repetitious and it's basically just about his electric guitar, but it's just so, I don't know, man. I get the feels or whatever, however Zach always phrases that. It hits me in the feels, like the Perfect Strangers uh, theme song. <laughs> good. That's a good um, one. Yeah. And it's like they were a big influence on DC, like mid-80s DC stuff. Like, um, whoa, someone's driving a race car. Um, embrace Mike Hampton's guitar playing. But really, the vibe is completely different. It's definitely more rooted in late seventies UK punk than, you know, whatever proto revolution summer, whatever you want to call that kind of mid eighties DC stuff that took influence from it. But they did cop a few licks. Um, just a friggin' incredible song by an incredible band that sort of is still under the radar. This, this album's been reissued twice. And like, it seems like it's cursed. Like every time it gets reissued, it's like, Oh, great. Another record label that has like no distribution and no one's ever going to see this either. <laughs> like someone like Num Numero Group or one of these like really like well put together um, reissue labels should just fucking put this out once and for all. And that's that. But definitely something to check out. And it and it's proof that like even those 70s guys, a lot of those 70s guys, da the damned included, um, still had some tricks up their sleeve by 81. Like their, their generation wasn't, you know, still had something to say musically. Hell yeah. I'm going to check this out. I never heard it before. So that's a nice reminder. Everyone, there's a playlist for every episode, 185 miles south.com. Click that playlist link at the top of the page. Also, you can just search for it on Spotify handle business. Okay. Let's go to you, Clevo for your number seven. Uh, yeah, it's funny because I was probably going to take something off that Empire record. Uh, <laughs> Whoa. But yeah, um, the, the funny thing about that, too, is it basically went out of print as soon as it came out. Um, so those guys in D.C. that got a hold of it, I, I don't necessarily it's it's kind of like this weird, this just weird right place, right time thing, because um, Steve Hankson had said that. It, Definitely, there were guys that were very influenced by it. I think One Last Wish is probably the closest to to what they sound like. Um, but anyways, for my seventh pick, last pick here, I was going to go another way, but I'm going to take X with Once Over Twice off of Wild Gift. Um, it's X. You know what you're getting. Um, I think uh, it's really, you know... By this time, uh, I, I think after, you know, the singles have been out, after the Los Angeles album has come out, um, I think Wild Gift holds up just as well as um, as Los Angeles and, and the singles. And um, just really another just classic ex-punk song. Yeah, sick. I can't wait uh, to dig into this. I never went past Los Angeles because of early L.A. punk. It's one of the records I don't love. So uh, stoked to hear another song. Hell yeah. Um, Dan, let's go to you for honorable mentions. You didn't go 100 miles north of Los Angeles? <laughs> what now? You didn't go uh, 100 miles north of Los Angeles? For what? You said you don't go past Los Angeles in your uh, next journey. I'm trying to make uh, an Oxnard joke here. Well, that would be 60 miles. 100 would oh. put you, uh, I don't know, somewhere past Goleta? Okay, well then, yeah, you don't go 100 miles. <laughs> <laughs> I whiffed on that. Dan, honorable mentions. Okay, um, Violence in Our Minds, Last Resort, Waiting for You, DOA, uh, Mainliner, Social D, I had Nazi Punks, Fuck Off, I had uh, Punks Not Dead, and Sex and Violence from Exploited. Uh, pretty much... Uh, John Wayne was a Nazi, the Stains. Yeah. Um, I, it's a shame that that didn't make it to the list. And then I, all the other Minor Threat songs, 
and um, I definitely wanted to get SPG by Red Alert on the list, and I can't believe I didn't... Oh, I didn't take uh, Suburban Rebels, the business, and that was one that I thought was on my short list. Um, so I me- messed up a bit, um, and then the KKK took my baby away since everyone shit on my pick and love that one, which I do. I liked it. <laughs> I liked it. It's just, it's, you know what I mean? Anyway, hell yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, Dan, and good call on the stains. I had that. That and the TSOL song were both on my list to take tonight, and I audibled out and took something else. So, Oh, yeah. uh, Partisan's Police Story. Yeah, um, I was surprised that know. didn't make your list. Yeah. It, uh, it, I think I may have like chosen it on a second. No, that was seventeen years of hell. Uh, anyway, just anyway. no mess, no fuss, just pure impact. The last resort. Yep. Okay. Uh, ben, forty-five seconds. Uh, Adolescents, kids of the black hole, legal weapon, daddy's gone mad, nasty facts, drive my car, Agent Orange, everything turns gray, the professionals, little boys, Channel Three, Manzanar, politi- political crap, slow death. Discharge, ain't no feeble bastard. The exploited, blown to bits. UK subs, plan of action. GBH, race, race against time. 45 grave, 45 grave. The crowd, pleasure seeker. Government issue, asshole. Ramones, KKK, took my baby away. X, universal corner. Television personalities, look back in anger. UK subhumans, parasites. Big boys, work without pay. Queer pills, time to fuck. Minutemen, search. Black flag, six pack. The alley cats, black hair girl. JFA, beach blanket, bong out. SOA, lost in space. The embarrassment. I'm a Don Juan. Glenn Danzig, who killed Marilyn? Times up, sucker. Clevo, honorables. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Adolescence, who is who? Uh, crass, penis envy. Uh, Kraut, uh, fix vengeance. Uh, let's see. The professionals. Uh, SOA, girl trouble, girl problem. Sorry, girl problems. Um, one that I wanted to get on there. Uh, Wipers, Youth of America. EP comes out this year, but Youth of America is a 10 minute song. Um, let's see. Uh, TSOL code blue, TSOL code blue. Uh, nasty facts, drive my car, discharge never again. GBH generals, youth brigade point of view. Uh, Mission of Burma, uh, Signals, Calls, and Marches EP, uh, Queer Pills, um, Empire, Expensive Sound, um, The Professionals. Did I say that already? Yeah, and that's what I got. Uh, TSOL, Silent Scream, The Stains, John Wayne was a Nazi, but not anymore. He was a Nazi. Life, even the score. What's up? The Wipers, Taking Too Long, Dead Kennedys, Nazi Punks, Fuck Off, Agent Orange, Everything Turns Gray, and The Last Goodbye, Subhumans, Canada, the song Behind My Smile. Dude, I bought that LP, the second LP, Incorrect Thoughts, because I thought that that was, or the whatever fucking LP that was, the first, it's the first LP. I thought it was on there. It's not. It's on like a Canadian comp. It got put on like the later versions of that LP, and it's like, God damn it. Like, what the fuck? Um, anyway, uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, Necros, IQ32, Youth Brigade, it's about time we had a change. Exploited, fucking, how much time you got, buddy? Dead Cities, Dogs of War, Punk's Not Dead, I Believe in Anarchy. Uh, 45 Grave with the song Evil of Hell Comes to Your House. SOA, the song Warzone. Dude, one of the greatest fuzz tones of all time. Let's go. Blitz, Someone's Gonna Die. Dan got it. JFA, Out of School, first song on the record. Head Cleaners, uh, the song Death Threat. Shout out to the String Bends. Shout out to the True Punks. Uh, the band The Hated with Innocent People. Subhumans, UK, Parasite. Misfits, Ghoul's Night Out, Halloween. The Business, Harry May, Suburban Rebels. Uh, Dead Boys, Third Generation Nation. That second record is such a fall off from the first one, but God damn, there's some good songs on there. It's just like it. I hate to call things overproduced. It just doesn't sound as snotty and whatever, but there's like sick tracks on there. If you love Dead Boys, like it's, it's worth like 1978, it. though. I know, but it's like it sounds so different than the first one. It's just it's totally lost its edge. Like it's it's a neutered Dead Boys, but like the songwriting is still there. Uh that's 78 it's not like here oh anyway whatever the fuck ever i'm gonna edit that so i don't come off like a dumbass uh <laughs> uh, uh the band llama with uh good luck pronouncing it vala uh channel three manzanar anti nowhere league streets of london dan talks often about songs where the verse is so good overpowers the chorus this is one god damn 
uh, cron Jan, lies, partisans, police story, negative approach, lost cause, wasted youth, fuck authority, uh, the band Soldier out of Washington, uh, the song Raping Dead Nuns, uh, always reminds me of Bed, you want to hear that song, uh, Abrasive Wheels, the Army song, Verukers, No Scapegoat, Shame on Dan for No Verukers, uh, Kraut, Kill for Cash, thought Clevo might take it, didn't, The Last Resort, uh, Violence in Our Minds, the demo tape came out that year. Uh, GBH Freak, <laughs> fucking so sick. Uh, the Minutemen, the song Black Sheep is the the gem off that uh, EP. Cheetah Chrome Motherfuckers, I like that song A Cool, however the fuck you pronounce that. Shout out to the Zound 7-inch. Uh, it's a record on Crass Records that has like ska parts on it, but somehow I fucking like it, like bizarro. Uh, and then finally Infra Riot, Kids of the 80s. Uh, the song that I took the most shit over on our best punk songs of the 80s, uh, it's on there. So what's up? Everyone, uh, hell yeah. Dan, where can the people find you? On Instagram, at Southport Instagrammer. Every third Friday at the Whistle Stop for Fucking in the Bushes. Every fourth Friday at the Cat Club in San Francisco for Club Leisure. Yep. Uh, and Ben, where can the people find you? On Instagram, at Future Confusion, that's the name of the band I sing and play guitar in. We have EP2 out now. Check it out. It's on Bandcamp. Future Confusion. Hot new sound, dude. They're coming with that 1.6 style. Check it out. Clevo, where can people find you? Uh, on Instagram, at Clevo. Hell yeah. Everyone, get at me. 185 miles south at gmail.com. I respond to everyone. And that's the way, dude. Uh, also, 185 miles south, Instagram, Twitter, uh, threads if that's even still a thing what the fuck is that anymore um but yeah get at us check out the playlist check out fucking old school hardcore it's the best thing in the world and tell your friends dude to uh check it out it's timeless music everyone we love you all we'll talk to you again next monday on patreon Get a royalty, 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 get a roy